Okay, let's get going to uh, lecture two. So uh, today we'll actually start doing some real work and looking at instruction set architectures. So um, before we do that, I just want to talk about computing in general. So there's a long, 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 long history of computing, um, going back to very early analog computers. Right, so what's an analog computer? Um, it's one that um, represents the variables in your problem as actual physical quantities of some kind. So the physical variable is an analog of some abstract uh, value you're trying to compute. Um, and then you use this scaled physical behavior to actually calculate results. And this is a very old um, technology. So here's the uh, this ancient mechanism they found in the sea and they realized after they <laughs> Uh, dusted the crust off that this was actually used to, to to calculate where planets would be, right? So this is a very, you know, it's a machine. It's not actually the planets. It's an analog of how planets move around. A set of gears that you would rotate around and find where things were to help in navigation, right? So it's an example of an analog computer. Um, modern day, um, we still have these around and things like wind tunnels are basically an analog computer. You could build a simulator, use a big supercomputer to calculate this, but sometimes it's just a lot cheaper and more effective to build a scale physical model and just run it this way and see what happens, right? So doing lots of simulations or other forms of calculation, analog computing is actually a, a way of doing stuff, right? Computing things. Um, but d d digital computers, on the other hand, you actually take the problem variables and you represent them as discrete numbers, you know, digitally, right? So finite values. Whereas in the analog computing world, you know, the physical, the arbitrary precision possibly in a physical space. Here you discrete things down, make them discrete. And the big advantage of making them discrete like this is you get uh, immunity to noise. So you can calculate things exactly to the limited precision you're using, right? So noise doesn't propagate through the calculation. Any kind of analog style computing, you're gonna have noise issues, uh, could be imprecision, errors accumulating, because your analog is not a perfect representation of the thing you're modeling, right? Digitally, if you can, as soon as you quantize it into some digital form, thereafter you can uh, you know, compute things to arbitrary precision. And what's important is when you do the same thing twice, you get the same result, right? So you can get deterministic repeatable uh, computations. Another huge advantage is you're not constrained by physically realizable functions, right? With analog computing, you've got to figure out how to build an analog of the compute computation you want to do. And that's in general not possible for all the things we can compute digitally, right? So, so with digital systems, you can you know, compute arbitrary things, anything that's computable. Um, and that's what we're focusing on in this class. And the history of programmable digital computers goes back quite a way. So Babbage is really the, the father of computing, um, and he's an interesting character. Um, he was, uh, um, he actually held the Lucasian professor chair at uh, Cambridge, the professor of mathematics at Cambridge University. Um, and he was interested in many, many, many things. And this Lucasian chair is a pretty famous chair. It was previously held by uh, Sir Isaac Newton, and then later it was held by Stephen Hawking. Um, amongst other people, so it's a pretty uh, prestigious chair. Um, he was interested in many things. Um, he was a professor in Cambridge, but he apparently never gave a single lecture. He just did research, government-funded research. Um, he was interested in many things. Um, and one of the his big frustrations, though, was at the time um, to evaluate, um, uh, evaluate num numerical problems, you would use uh, printed tables. So basically, people would go away, calculate values, and put tables of things like logarithms, sines, cosines, all those functions you wouldn't actually calculate by hand. You'd have a lookup table that would be printed. Uh, the problem was these were done by hand, and then the typeset, and the resulting tables often had errors in. So you do a custom computation, look it up in the table, and the number in the table would be wrong, and your computation would, wouldn't work out as a result. So he was really fed up with this and decided that, um, you know, having looked at how people, um, to calculate these tables, people came up with schemes to organize people to do computations. You'd have rows and rows of people sitting at tables, each doing long multiplication, long division, whatever. And you'd figure out algorithms that move bits of paper around the room so they would compute some, some problem, including these tables. He was inspired by how humans were doing this to figure out if you could do it mechanically. And his goal was actually to go from a purely mechanical system that would not only do the calculation, but also print it out. Because he wanted to avoid the typesetting stage, which is also a cause of errors. So he wanted to build something that would calculate and print out these tables so he could then use them in his, in his work. That was his motivation to get going in computing. Um, and the first idea he came up with was something called the difference engine. So the difference engine um, was um, a way of calculating any um, continuous function that you can approximate with a polynomial, right? So any kind of anything that some you can represent as a polynomial, um, 
if you start this as an example, the n squared plus m plus 41, if you differentiate that, you know, you get the you know, first derivative, differentiate again, you get the second derivative, and if you differentiate often enough, you end up with constants, right? And starting from constants, you can work backwards, and just by using uh, repeated addition, you can calculate um, a run of values to for the function across some range. So just to show you how that works, um, so you want to calculate this function at all these different values of n. Um, you can see that the you know, second derivative is a constant, it's just 2. Um, uh, the first derivative um, is 2n. Um, we'll just represent that by 2 there. And then um, we start off, we initialize it with a base constant 41, right? So what you figure out is to calculate the next value of d1n is just this constant 2. So I can just add 2, 1 to 2 to get 4 and so on. So just kind of form of dynamic programming. I'm just building out all the values across this timeline from 0 to or across the value domain of the function from n equals 0 to 4. And by sort of doing this repeated addition, I can reconstruct the, the values for that, that level of, of, of the form and then go ahead and add this on here. Right. So just by doing additions, I can build up any polynomial function using this difference engine. Right. So that was his idea. So any, any function I can approximate the polynomial, I can differentiate enough times to get down to constants. Then working backwards, I can add the things up again to re reconstruct that function and I calculate its value across some range like this. So basically, you just need to build a machine that could hold the different constants and add them in a certain pattern to produce these, these values. That was the idea behind the difference engine. So, um, so we had this idea, he wrote papers on it, but he didn't actually finish the design and implementation of this because he'd sort of moved on to bigger things, which was the analytical engine. But uh, a bunch of years later, um, a fellow in uh, I think Sweden and his son, they actually took those ideas and actually built a working version. Um, this was in the 1855, and they actually sold a copy to the British government. And the application for this was really um, um, artillery tables. So when you were you know, uh, firing a gun, you need to know how much charge you put in with a given angle of the uh, gun and a given distance you're trying to shoot and the wind speed and all these things. And they'd feed it into these tables to figure out how much charge to put in, how much gunpowder to put in the gun. That was kind of the application. Um, so these guys sold a copy to the British government. And actually, uh, more recently, sort of recent times, people have actually taken those plans and show that you can actually recreate that system using the technology available at the time. So with the t machining tolerances and everything, they could show you could actually build this difference engine. I mean, Schultz apparently did. They just recreated this. There's actually one at the Science Museum. There's one down in the South Bay. If you want to go check it out at the Computer History Museum. So this is, you know, it's a hand crank machine. Here's the hand crank, right? So it's got those, those towers are holding the numbers. As you turn the crank, it kind of winds around, does the additions, and actually um, will print out the, uh, the results. Okay, so this was you know, his first application, a real machine. But this was a um, you know, relatively simple thing. It's just a calculator, right? It's calculating, calculating in a sense of you know, pocket calculator. You can you accept it as a crank stepping through these steps. Um, pretty simple machine. But after working on that for a while, what Babbage got excited about was this other thing, the idea of an analytical engine. And this was really the, the first thing that's recognizable as a general purpose digital computer and actually has a lot of features of modern day digital computers. It's surprisingly advanced. Um, so for example, it has a store, which is basically main memory. In this case, a thousand words of storage, where each word is 40 decimal digits. Um, there's a mill, which is the arithmetic unit, which actually does compute. It's like the ALU, a modern computer, addition, multiplication, division. It also supported conditional branching and looping, and even like, took exceptions on overflow. Right. If there's an overflow, the machine would jam and a bell would ring, right? Tell you that something's gone wrong in the computation. It even had a form of microcode. Uh, there was this structure called the barrel, which was basically like a, um, a music box. There was a barrel with pins coming off of it that would rotate around and cause different operations to happen, uh, to sequence different little operations. Um, so this machine, the input and output was all on punch cards. This was known technology from the, the loom era, right? So the data would come in on punch cards. Um, and each card would hold an instruction, and it would have an opcode and a three address format. There two sources and one destination, where those were in the store, which was the, the main memory here. Um, now, the way branches happened was it would redirect where the cards came from. So that's how they did uh, branching in the machine. Um, and I.O. for this machine, it would actually punch new cards as well as the output to give you the output. Yeah, I guess you said that here. 
Um, so for this design, only small pieces of this were ever built. But this was kind of his big, uh, big project was doing this thing. And um, I think a lot of design was done. There were many, it wasn't just one design that he iterated on this quite a lot. There was different pieces built, then he would change the design to the next prototype and so on. So there wasn't just one analytical engine, but you know, this is 1837, uh, where he's coming up with all the basic ingredients of a, uh, a modern uh, digital computer. Now it's kind of interesting to look at some of the design choices he made. Um, uh, one, one was that he chose decimal for the number representation inside the machine. So why did he choose decimal? We actually considered binary, I know the basis. But the reason he chose decimal was the thing was going to be built with mechanical gears. And um, there was no clear advantage to binary if you're building things with mechanical gears. And the other advantage, one big advantage of decimal was you, know, you could print numbers on the gears and humans could just debug the machine by looking at it and seeing what numbers were stored in which location in memory. Um, another design was digital, had 40 digit precision. This is basically 133 bits you know, in each word. Um, and the reason he went that high was um, it was a fixed point machine and there wasn't any floating point. And this was designed to make it easy to map problems to the machine without worrying about scaling. Um, now some other interesting sort of technology things, um, he had to invent a bunch of mechanical ideas. And this idea of locking uh, was a form of uh, nonlinear mechanical amplification. And this was to overcome noise in moving things around the machine. Right? So remember, building a digital computer, it's important to uh, cancel out noise by having thresholds and picking whether it's above or below a threshold. And he did this mechanically. Um, and this is you know, to avoid like small errors in the angle of a gear from accumulating, giving you the wrong value. Right? It would snap back to being a, a correct value. Also, the carry. Uh, Ada was a um, basically a version of the, the pass transistor carry propagate you use today in CMOS adders and early in Relay Atlas. So we had this idea of a fast parallel adder scheme uh, inside the ALU of this machine. Okay, so pretty interesting. Now, one of the, the big outcomes of this was um, so he actually acted as a mentor for Ada Lovelace, um, and she, you know, was the first programmer. So um, she basically um, took the notes he'd written. He gave these lectures that were um, transcribed into Italian by another fellow, Luigi Menabre. Um, he published notes about those lectures, but then Ada Lovelace took those lectures and actually not only translated them, she added a lot to them herself. So she you know, added a lot more of her own uh, insight to those uh, English version of those notes. And she figured out you know, the whole idea of programming. And uh, she gave this what's f the first known program, which was something that calculated Bernoulli numbers using the instruction set of this analytical engine. Um, and what she's actually a very interesting character. She had, she was very interested in lots of things. Again, very imaginative, and she was, you know, imagined many uses beyond the calculations of tables. So table calculation was like the the premier application of computers at the time. The way you think about it, it took a long time to run a computation on these mechanical computers. So you wanted to capture that and store it in the form of a table, so then everybody else could use that result in the form of a captured table. And that was the sort of mindset at the time. But she was interested in things like how you would use this computer to model the brain, for example. She was back in those days. She was even thinking about things like that. So quite an impressive uh, character and really the first programmer. Okay, so that's kind of the prehistory of um, uh, computing. Um, and that was the mid-1800s. And really not much happened after that, um, kind of a dark time um, in computing. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, um, there was a lot of interest in analog computing um, because it was feasible to build machines that could do a reasonable amount of compute using analog components. Like digital tends to be more expensive in components, right? Whereas analog, you have the you know, luxury of mapping things one to one from a physical variable in the thing you're modeling to a physical part of the machine, right? Um, and so it's a lot of development of uh, analog computing in the first part of the 20th century. Um, but during the 30s and 40s, as um, you know, relays got better and uh, tubes appeared, people started building programmable digital calculators. And I'll make a distinction here. These are calculators in that they, they can't really do arbitrary compute. They can only do things like straight line runs of code um, and simple loops. They, they, they cannot branch in any, conditionally branch in any meaningful way, right? So they're really just calculators. And there was a bunch of these that were built, and um, these really accelerated, you know, primarily driven by the Second World War. And like the war effort really advanced computing technology a lot. Um, but these were the, you know, so some, you know, primo examples of the, uh, digital calculators at the time. I'll just go over these a little bit, get an idea what was going on. So this is uh, at the Nassau Berry's linear equation solver. And this was a fixed function calculator. 
and it could solve up to 29 simultaneous linear equations. So it's a dedicated, you can think of it as a specialized engine for doing this one task, solving simultaneous linear equations. The interesting features of this was it did use digital binary arithmetic um, with 50-bit um, words. Um, it had DRAM, um, which in this case was a rotating drum of capacitors. So the drum would have one half of the capacitor and the, the read and refresh heads were another plate that the thing would rotate by. So as the drum rotated around, you would read the charge off and then you would recharge it on the way around. So every trip around the drum, you were refreshing the values held on those uh, capacitors. Um, and it used vacuum logic for doing the actual uh, processing. So, um, and actually, th uh, in a very famous patent dispute with Ecuador Moakley, uh, ended up, this was actually awarded the, this was credited as being the inventor of the automatic digital electronic computer, although it didn't actually have branches and couldn't really do uh, general computing. Um, I think the patent was more about digital binary uh, computing. Another famous set of machines were built by uh, this fellow in uh, Germany, Konrad Zeus, um, and this is the Zeus C3, um, and this just used relays, so it was an electromechanical machine. Um, very compact, only 2,000 relays, but this machine had normalized phony point arithmetic, um, and it had uh, support for infinities, undefined, you know, kind of things you see in the IEEE standard today. Um, uh, 64 words of memory, and a two-stage pipeline, but there again, there was no conditional branch. It was programmed via paper tape. So you put the program on a paper tape, and you'd feed that in, and it would just churn through the steps you had encoded on the paper tape to do the calculations, right? Um, so this was an uh, important early machine. Um, uh, now we're getting on to bigger machines. This was a Harvard Mark I. Um, again, this was just a calculator, but it was a very big, capable calculator. Um, so this is proposed by uh, Howard Aiken at Harvard and then funded and built by IBM, right? But it was actually um, you know, created up, up at Harvard. And this is the origin of the term Harvard-style architecture um, from the uh, Harvard Mark I. Um, and it was mostly mechanical, but it had um, some electrically controlled relays and gears, so partly electrical. Um, weighed five tons, right? And had uh, 750,000 components. So this was kind of a beast at the time. Um, so memory held 72 numbers, each of 23 decimal digits. Um, and, you know, the speed was, you know, on the order of seconds to do things, right? To, to do an add, multiply, divide. Any kind of trig function would take you like a minute for this machine to, to clatter through and calculate that. Um, again, the instructions were held on paper tape at a simple two-address format. Um, and um, it could run long programs automatically. And you did loops by just making the paper tape into loops and gluing it around. So just cycle around. Um, so no conditional branch. Um, and actually, what's interesting is when this was proposed to the government, they, they talked about Babbage and everything else, but it really was a much more primitive machine than the analytical engine, right? It was a much simpler design than the analytical engine. Even though the proposal talked about all these things, the actual thing they built was much more primitive than the analytical engine. But it was actually built and kind of worked. Um, but after um, this early machine, sort of towards the end of the war, people started thinking about more advanced and more general purpose computing. And really the ENIAC, which was 1946, this was really the first true general purpose electronic computer, right? So Babbage's machine was mechanical, this was electronic. And being electronic, the big advantage was it was very fast. Like the previous calculating machines we just talked about, there was a role electromechanical, so you had relays moving and gears moving, so they were kind of limited by mechanical speeds of operation, but this one was actually electronic. Um, it was started during World War II, and lo and behold, it was used to calculate firing tables again. So this is, you know, the primo application. The killer app for computers there was literally, you know, firing tables for, <laughs> right. Um, so this thing had nearly, you know, 18,000 vacuum tubes, um, weighed 30 tons. This was a big machine. Um, you know, occupied, you know, 1,800 square foot, so you know, a large apartment, um, 150 kilowatts of power. So this was a very big very big beast, um, one of the biggest pieces of electronic machinery anybody had ever built, you know. Um, it had 12 10 decimal digit accumulators, but most importantly, it had a conditional branch, right? So you could actually write, you know, honest to goodness, real programs on it. Um, the only thing about this style of machine, though, it was programmed by plug boards and switches. So it was purely electronic, but the way you um, programmed it was actually by setting switches and doing patch cables to set up the program in this machine. 
um, which was very time consuming. And this became apparent, this was kind of a bug because um, it was incredibly fast at doing compute. So, you know, you could do a 10 digit by 10 digit multiply in 2.8 milliseconds, right? You've gone from like second scale down to millisecond scale, like 2000 times faster than the Harvard Mark I. So this move from mechanical to electronic, massive increase in the speed of compute. So as a result, it was so fast, it was completely IO bound. And what was worse, it was mostly reprogramming bound. So you set up the problem, all these plug boards and switches, then you ran it for a few seconds, got the results, then you would go back to spending days rewiring the machine to do the next problem. And that's literally what happened. Uh, another issue was, because this was so big and had so many vacuum tubes, it was often broken. Like five days was the longest time between the machine breaking down, right? And you know, you'd hope that you'd finish programming it before um, it broke down again. So this was a big beast, this is a picture of it. And so what you can see is all these switches, that's how you inserted numbers and all those patch cables. So this is how you program the machine. You'd walk around, set the switches, plug in the cables to set up your program and hope you got it correct. Like debugging is mainly going around and did I plug the right cable in, right? Did I set the switch to the right value? So, you know, it would literally take days to change the program on this thing. But then it was electronic, so it would run really fast. Like in seconds, you'd finish most compute computations you'd want to do on this machine, right? Um, so based on that experience, um, Eckhart and Mowgli thought, okay, we we'll always have to do something different. So they came up with the idea of EDVAC. Um, and this is where they came up with the idea of a stored program concept. So the idea of a stored program is, instead of having the program represented physically by switches and cables, I represent the program as bit stored in memory, right? And so then I can easily reprogram just by loading different bit patterns into the, the memory of the machine, instead of physically changing the machine with cables and switches. Um, and von Neumann enters the, the plot at this point. Um, he was consulting at UPenn when they were working on this stuff. And he actually wrote up all these ideas. And this was the, the first draft of a report. And EDVAC was his famous uh, a technical report he, he typed up. Now what happened next was kind of uh, amusing. So, um, so an admin level guy at UPenn um, got this draft. And as with any tech report, was going to circulate it widely. So he did. So you know, the way they published then, they would actually just ship this off to various other institutions. So they had this tech report. Um, von Neumann only had his name on the report. Um, and this guy circulated to lots of other institutions and everybody got really excited about this idea of a stored program computer. Um, but this also kind of ruined the chances of these guys patenting it. Um, and it also kind of gave sole credit to von Neumann for these ideas. Already he came along later and was just part of the discussions that had started a long time before he got there. And it was really echoed to Mowgli who'd been doing most of the architecture work here. Um, so one of the sort of threads here is that um, Morris Wilkes, who's over in the UK at the time, he got this report, was very excited about it and then decided to come to the US. They had this big workshop on how to build computers in the US. Um, so uh, he came over and then he was uh, invented a lot of things. I'll talk about in a minute. So, so based on the experience with ENIAC, they came up with this idea of store program computer they're going to implement in EDVAC. They didn't get around to doing EDVAC for a, a while. Um, but what they actually did was, um, a little bit later on, they went back and modified ENIAC to make it a store program machine. They took that big beast with all the cables and switches. And um, they allowed it to run in stored program mode, but it was six times slower than when it was hardwired, right? So there was a performance hit for uh, making it use a stored program mode. But this was still overall a massive win because you know now you could reprogram it more, much more quickly and, and reasonably, right? Um, okay, yeah. And EDVAC, they finally got built, they're mostly working, but a lot later on. And this was delayed by all these patent disputes and stuff going on around this um, computing technology. Meantime, inspired by all this, this tech report and this, this workshop in the US, a few groups in the UK um, actually built the first stored program computers. Um, and ac actually the first one was this tiny one, which is a very small scale computer um, the guys at Manchester University built. And th they really built this computer just to demonstrate their storage technology. So what they come up with is what's called a Williams tube, a Williams Kilburn tube. And this was a CRT, like a cathode ray tube. And the way this stored data was actually in the phosphor on the screen. So the idea was, you know, like in an old style TV or old style CRT, the electron beam hits the phosphor, um, captures energy, lights up, then it decays slowly over time emitting light. Um, but they could detect that that charge was stored there with another beam reading it, and then they could refresh and write it back. So it was a dynamic memory that relied on the phosphor to store the, the charge with this beam scanning over it repeatedly, right? 
And this gave them a, a r relatively rapid random access to electron electronic storage devices. This is really one of the first um, sort of main memory, random access main memory um, technologies. So in order to prove this thing, prove out this design of this tube, they built a very tiny computer. Um, uh, what was it called? It was called the, uh, the Mini or something. Uh, the Baby, yeah, the Baby. <laughs> Manchester Baby. Um, and this ran, you know, supposedly the first store program in June 1948. Um, but it wasn't really a full-scale machine. It was just like only had 32 words of memory or something. It was, it was a very tiny, even for that time, it was a tiny little machine, but it you know, did run the first store program by some measure. Um, later on, they led to the, the Manchester Mark I, which was a, a much bigger full-scale machine. This was actually a pretty important machine. It led to introduce the concept of index registers, and it was commercialized by Ferranti. Right? That's a picture of the Williams tube. But the big... The first big scale real computer was EDSAC, stored program computer was EDSAC. Um, and this was Morris Wilkes, later Sir Morris Wilkes. He went to the uh, US, went to this workshop, came out to Cambridge, and decided they were going to have a project to build the, the first stored program computer. Um, and so this used um, Mercury delay line storage to hold its main memory. So a Mercury delay line is basically a long uh, tube of mercury. Um, where at one end you have a basically a small transducer like a loudspeaker, and at the other end you have something like a microphone. And the idea is you loudspeaker loud loud injects pulses into the mercury, causing little bumps and ripples on the mercury that then transmit down the, the line to the other end where they're received, and you detect them with the speaker -like, uh, microphone-like assembly, and then you amplify and send it back in again. So you have this pattern of pulses going down this mercury delay line, and that's your main store. Okay, so it's basically a serial access memory. You have to wait for the bits to come around again before you can pull them out of the main memory. But that was a common early main memory technology. Um, so this had you know, 1024 words of 17 bits, um, plus this one bit of padding in the delay line to separate the words from each other and to give you some framing start symbols. Um, the machine used two's complement binary arithmetic. It was an accumulator-based ISA, and they actually used self-modifying code for indexing, which you're going to see in the problem set. How, how that works. Um, so one interesting thing with this machine, now the machine started getting a bit bigger, the idea of store programs. People realized they're going to have to do things like subroutines, right? So, okay, now you're going to have commonly reused libraries of code. And actually, um, David Wheeler, um, who, world, who also has a distinction of earning the world's first computer science PhD, um, he invented the subroutine, right? You basically, the thing called the Wheeler jump was how you did a subroutine call, right? So you got to put yourself back in this context prior to that, there was no need for a subroutine. Your code was just one routine that calculated the table, for example. You just hand wrote the whole thing. Now machines got a bit more complex. People thought about reusing code and packaging them into subroutines. Um, so actually, I, I met David Wheeler when I was looking to do a PhD. So he was at Cambridge. I, I got to see him. Um, there was sort of several layers of people I had to get to before I got to talk to him. He's an unusual character. Um, but I remember what he told me back then was, you know, there's no research left in computer architecture. It's kind of all been done. I don't know why you want to do a PhD in computer <laughs> architecture. <laughs> um, yeah, I think from his perspective, probably, yeah. You know, this, this scale of, you know, inventing a subroutine, everything was probably peanuts after that. So, um, yeah. Um, the, um, so actually, what was interesting, the UK's first commercial computer was actually based on EDSAC and ran business software in 1951. So this is one of the very first commercial computers anywhere, a uh, business computer. <laughs> What's funny is the software for this was still running in the 1980s in emulation um, in the UK, so <laughs> on some mainframes. Um, so EDSAC was the original design. EDSAC 2 was a follow-on, sort of much improved uh, design. And this, this was the first machine that had microprogram control. Based on the experience of building the control logic for EDSAC, uh, Morris Wilkes came up with the idea of microcode that he used in the EDSAC 2. Um, so this is also kind of transition where computers started being manufactured commercially. So, you know, Second World War ended, you know, a lot of early computer design between sort of late 40s. Now in the early 50s, you people started trying to commercialize this. So Eckert and Morkley left UPenn and formed the Eckert Morkley Computer Corporation. And um, the first design was actually a two CPU machine. Um, it was a modic processor, but these were set up as master-slave checkers. They would check each other. And the thing was called Binac. Um, the problem with this was apparently they were supposed to check each other, but they never agreed on anything, so the machine never worked, right? So <laughs> there was enough faults in both sides that nothing, nothing ever worked. So it never worked. I think there was only one that was actually shipped. Um, based on this, they came up with a better idea, which was the second commercial computer, Univac. Uh, 
This was, again, like the EDSAC, this used mercury delay line memory, 1,000 words or 12 characters. Um, but this was actually a very um, successful machine and very popular, you know, um, widespread knowledge about this was a computer that most people saw as their first computer because it was on TV. And it was uh, famously used to predict the pres presidential election in 1952 where it actually forecast the opposite thing that most people have been predicting based on uh, uh, early polling. Um, it was a commercial success. They actually sold 46 units at over a million dollars each back in, in that time. Um, and it was, you know, going back in history, people often mistakenly think Univac was an IBM machine, but it wasn't. It was Echo and Mulkley that did this, not, not IBM. Just everybody assumed IBM had all built all the computers, but this was actually an <laughs> a, a Echo and Mulkley machine. Right. So, um, so what was IBM doing? So IBM had been tracking all this, and they'd been making a lot of money. They are making plenty of money anyway um, from all their other stuff. So back in the early 1900s, they kind of got started building uh, mechanical tabulating machines to, for the census. So you know, the, the census data was gath gathered on punch cards, and they built machines that would tabulate and extract different kinds of data from those um, punch cards. And they had a successful line of business data processing uh, machines based on that kind of technology. But they obviously got interested in computing as well. Um, just picking on the 701, this was IBM's first commercial scientific computer. Um, the main memory here was 72 of those Williams tubes, um, those phosphor tubes, uh, with a kilobit per tube, so you know, 32 bits by 32 bits. What was cool about this technology was the programmer could see every bit of the machine, because they just have all these CRTs lined up, and all those dots are actually the state of your machine. That was actually the memory, right? What you saw was the memory of the machine, all right? Um, the memory took 12, 12 microseconds to access. Uh, 701 accumulator ISA, um, sign magnitude fixed point, 80 bit, 36 bit. Um, and this machine is responsible for this famous misquote you hear about, you know, the guys at IBM, uh, Thomas Watson. Um, you know, there's, you know, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. You often see this misattributed to this guy, this is what he said. What they actually said was in a meeting to the shareholders, he relayed the news that um, on a trip where they went around selling this machine, they thought they'd only get orders for five, but they actually came home with orders for 18. So this was their sales projection was five machines, right? But they actually came back with many more orders. This is really the start of commercial computing taking off. And the sort of transition here is people stopped building their own computers, right? Prior to this, you wanted a computer, you had to build one, right? Now you have a commercial enterprise. People are actually manufacturing computers and selling them, right? And this is, so the early 50s is when this, this actually started. Um, and really, the, the first popular mass-produced computer was this thing called the IBM 650. Um, and it was uh, very low cost um, because it relied on a, um, a drum-based storage. This was the drum. It was a, a, a cylinder that rotated at a high speed with magnetic material on the surface of the cylinder. And then you have parallel read heads that would read off data from the um, tracks on the drum. Um, it had a digit serial ALU, so it had one digit um, per cycle in the ALU. And they made almost 2,000. Um, so this is a very popular machine, um, and this is kind of the architecture of this, this machine. So you have a, this is the rotating drum, which is the main memory, and it stored, um, um, you know, either 1,000 or 2,000, depending on the model, 10-digit decimal words. That was the main memory. Um, so the accumulator, where everything happened, was a 20-decimal-digit accumulator, but you had a one-digit, one-decimal-digit adder that would do addition. So when you wanted to add multiple digits and multiple-digit words, you would go through the one-digit adder and just the carry would kind of propagate around uh, until you finished accumulating the results. When you want to do a multiply, um, you would hold the, uh, one of the operands in one part of the accumulator, I think one was up here, then you would go through and do the sort of long multiplication just by doing repeated single digit additions until you build up the multiplier result. And a similar thing was used for the uh, division. So it's a digit serial um, ALU. Now, the uh, the 650 instruction set is kind of interesting. Um, the address and data were 10-digit decimal words. So addresses and data were all di decimal, 10-digit decimal. It was designed for business data processing. So, you know, lots of, you know, money amounts. That's why they use decimal. Um, the instruction set a two-digit opcode, 44 instructions. Um, they had, you know, optional expansions of the 96, 97 instructions. They had instruction set extensions. Um, a four-digit data address, four-digit next instruction address. So every single instruction uh, not only had the address of the data you would operate, but also the address of the next instruction. So every instruction did a jump to another instruction. Kay. So 
And the reason they did this was um, you would lay out the instructions on the drum so that once you finish processing one instruction, the next instruction would be close by and you could read it from the drum head. Otherwise, you have to wait for the drum rotational latency to come around. So when you're writing code for this machine, you're planning the instructions according to where and putting them in memory so they'd be in the right place at the right time as the drums span around. You had a few extra instructions, special ones to you know, make advantage of physical design. You could you could scan all the words on a track and sort of search for some key in, in, the, in, the, in a database that you were keeping on there, for example. Um, <coughs> so, okay, so now, so these are early machines, early instruction sets. We're starting to get commercial computing. Um, and one thing about all these instruction sets, they were all very simple, right? You know, simple instruction sets are not a new invention. When you first started building computers, they had to be simple. There's no choice. You didn't have enough components to make them complex, right? And most of them were based on an accumulator-style machine. Because it wasn't, it was very expensive to build any logic, so you build the uh, accumulators out of the expensive logic, and also the the mental model was very much like calculators. So people were used to desktop calculators, so the model was the program was just automating what you would do by hand with the calculator, and so the notion of the accumulator was really the display you had on a regular calculator, and so all your instructions are based on that calculator model. Um, over time, people started building software and then realized, well, we need other things apart from what you'd expect from a calculator. Uh, one of the big inventions was index registers, and this was added to avoid the need for self-modifying code to step through an array. When you look at the EDSAC in the problem set, you'll see how cumbersome it was to uh, actually do array code with that thing. You basically had to modify the instructions in memory to change the address in each instruction to load a value from a different point in an array. Um, and over time, as people um, work the machines, they're starting adding more registers. Also, as the components got cheaper, they could add more stuff in the CPU. So they added more <coughs> index registers. And then they started adding operations on the index registers, and these things kind of evolved into being basic general purpose registers with instructions that operate on the values in the registers, right? So these things evolved over time. But um, some other options were also explored in the early days, and you've read about one of these, um, the B5000. So this was a stack-based machine, and uh, now we're sort of entering the 60s. Um, so the idea of a stack machine is that um, well, one thing about the B5000 in particular, the idea was to hide the instruction set completely from the programmer, right? So people are sort of realizing at this point in time that it, prior to this, the machines were designed, the instruction sets were designed together. So you build a machine, and then you had the instruction set for that machine, and the instruction set encoded lots of details about that implementation. For example, in the 650, you were encoding the fact there was a drum rotating around by the way you encode the instruction set. Right? The other machines also had, you know, a lot of the details were tied to that particular physical machine. And you know, you couldn't, the next machine would be completely different physical design, completely different instruction set, you'd have to recode everything. So now people realized that was a problem and they wanted to um, make code more portable between machines. And one idea is to do it at the language level. So in the B5000, you wanted to hide from the programmer using a high-level language. So Algol was the you know, high-level language that every, all the uh, academics and key people in the industry had agreed would be the you know, fo formation, foundation of all future high-level languages. Um, and so the B5000 was designed uh, with a stack architecture. And one of the goals of stack architecture was really to simplify compilation. So compiler technology is still quite primitive, and they're easy, but it was easy to map expressions down to stack operations. And they thought this would make compilation easier. Um, and there was a lot of other reasons they thought a stack architecture would be better. Um, it's easier to do recursive subroutine calls and do interrupt handling just by pushing everything on the stack. So stack machine, how does it work? If you have some expression you want to evaluate. If you've ever used a HP calculator, you'll be familiar with this. You go to reverse Polish notation. Um, so you can just walk that tree in a given order that will tell you how to fetch the operands and apply the operators so that when you, um, you have an evaluation stack, and so each instruction in the machine is either something that you know, pushes an operand onto the stack, so here's A being pushed onto the stack, you push B onto the stack, push C onto the stack, do a multiply, that's now an operation. So the multiply finds its operands on the stack and leaves its result on the stack. All right, so you do that multiply there. And then the result is left on the stack. Then you do the add, which adds this value to here um, and leaves that on the stack, right, and so on. So you just go ahead and do the others. So um, as a stack-based architecture, the you know, purported advantage is you get denser encoding because you don't have to say where the operands are. It's implicit that they're on the stack. Right, and in the problem set, you're going to look at this. You're going to have to build your own ISA in the problem set, stack-based ISA, and compare it to the RISC-V ISA and see which one's better. 
Um, <laughs> right, right. Um, so now we'll talk about just the intro to the second paper, which was the, the 360. And this was, this was a really, really important machine, so, or architecture. So what had happened is IBM, commercial computers were successful. They were selling a lot of them, um, and they started to diversify into different markets. And they had these different lines of computers. The 701, 650 was the drum-based machine. The 701 was scientific. 50, 650 was the business data processing. Then they had the high-end uh, scientific and the real-time uh, computing machines. Um, and each of these lines of computers had its own instruction set, so completely different assembly code. Um, their own I.O. system and secondary storage, so the I.O. peripherals are all completely different and programmed in different ways on each of these machines. Um, their own assemblers, compilers, libraries, and they're, you know, their own, they're designed for their own market niche. And so IBM looked at this and they made a very bold bet. They actually bet the entire company on this. You know, the investment they put in the 360 development, if they hadn't worked out, IBM would have folded. Right, it was a really big bet by the, the company. Um, and so in the paper, you read about this, but they had all these um, um, goals for this new, new machine design. It has to lend itself to growth, successful machines. There must be a general method for connected I.O. devices. And they want to focus on productivity. So, you know, how fast can programmers produce solutions on the machine, not just how fast does the machine run. They want it to run operating systems so the machine can supervise itself. So it can, you know, take jobs off a batch queue and run them one after the other without the operator having to load things on and off the machine. Um, a uh, big emphasis on hardware fault checking. Machine, the component read at the time was still very unreliable, so machines would often fail. They want the machine to help in diagnosing where th things went wrong, so the engineer could more quickly, uh, maintenance engineer could quickly repair the machine. And they wanted to make it easy to, you know, build in this fault tolerance. Also, there, you know, some problems required floating point larger than 36 bits. Right, that was another observation. Right. So. One of the things they decided in this machine design was uh, to go with a general purpose register organization. And so in the paper, you'll see they had a long list of why. Um, so the idea was that, you know, some people thought stacks were better because you had this cache of the top of stack held in fast registers inside the CPU. And most of your operands are coming from this, you know, fast uh, set of registers. But, you know, the sort of Amdahl, Blau, and Brooks, they kind of observed that, well, really the, the advantage is that you have these fast registers, not really the way they're used in a stack. Um, also, they saw that the stack wasn't actually that effective as a um, means of obtaining operands. Only half the time would you actually find the correct value you wanted to be on top of the stack. The rest of the time, you'd have to shuffle around uh, the data on the stack. And one thing you'll find when you're building your stack ISA is you're going to need to add instructions to do things like duplicate a value or copy a value from somewhere down the stack to the top of the stack, because otherwise you just can't do, you just can't compute things, right? Um, so a lot of those sort of stack shuffling operations to move data to the right place they would, you know, blow up the, the code size, actually. Um, and this advantage of instruction density you think you get from a stack because you have implicit addresses, you get pretty close to that by, if you just have a small register set, you only need a few bits to specify which register you're using, right? So that, that doesn't take many bits. Instead of prior to that, the accumulator machines, typically the only addressing mode was an absolute address in memory, right? You had some field in each instruction that pointed at some word in memory. That was the initial accumulator-based ISA design. But once you went to a more general purpose register machine, most of the instructions just operated on registers. So you only needed a few bits to say which register you needed. Um, and you know, doing this plus not needing to shuffle things around to get the right opera in the right place meant that you got comparable density for this general purpose register machine. Also, you know, actually, you know, in hardware, managing the stack add, added complexity. Um, yeah, the recursive subroutine advantage, basically better compilers, better linkage conventions meant you didn't really, there wasn't really a big advantage there. Um, and some other things. Okay, so the 360. So um, this was a general purpose register machine, 16 general purpose 32 bit registers can be used as index and base. Register zero has special properties. Um, four floating point 64 bit registers. Programmer status word, and it was a 32 bit machine with 24 bit addresses, but actually no, none of the instructions was limited by encoded the fact it was limited to 24-bit addresses. So later versions actually had 31-bit, um, and then later 64-bit address base. Um, data formats, 8-bit bytes, 16-bit half words, 32-bit words. Very, it looks like a modern machine. When you look at the ISA design, it looks like a modern machine, and that's no accident. The IBM 360 was such an important machine that it kind of set a lot of these design decisions for all following machines, right? So basically, bytes are 8 bits because of the 360, right? Um, 
Yeah, that's why they take this long today. And if you read the paper, going through the paper, you'll we'll go over that, the discussions they had about this. So one of the big ideas they had was separating the instruction set architecture, assembly code, from the machine implementation. And the motivation was to provide common software support for all these different um, application areas, from low-end machines to real-time machines to business machines to scientific machines. They wanted to have one ISA um, so they would make common all the um, software support for all of them. And the idea was they could figure out how to build the implementations. Uh, a large part of the design goals was to make the ISA work well on all these different implementation styles, everything from low-end machines to high-end machines. So this was really the first true ISA designed as a portable machine um, software interface. That's why it's such an um, important, uh, important development, important platform. Okay, so yeah, the other thing is it still survives today. So this was a big success for IBM. It's still a big success for IBM. They make billions of dollars selling these machines. Um, they've advanced a lot. So the newer machines are, uh, have a 64-bit address base. They run Linux. Um, they can run thousands of virtual machines on each mainframe. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of things happen to it. Basically, the core ISA is still the same uh, that was back in 1964. So very, uh, very important uh, class of machines.